In August of 1955, in Money, Mississippi, two white men, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam, lynched a 14-year-old African-American boy named Emmett Till for allegedly whistling at Carolyn Bryant, who was Roy's wife. He was later found dead tied to a cotton gin fan in the Tallahatchie River by a fisherman. His open casket funeral enraged the entire country and inspired people like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. to start what is known now as the early civil rights movement. His death forever changed the way our society functions and will always be the turning point that sparked the fight for racial equality. Emmett Till's lynching came in a time of great racial tension in the United States. Between 1877 and 1950, over 4,000 African Americans were lynched in southern states. On June 5, 1950, the U.S. Supreme Court delivered its ruling on the Sweat v. Painter and McLaurin v. Oklahoma court cases, saying that the University of Texas Law School and the University of Oklahoma Law School could not segregate black students from white students. A little bit over a year before Emmett's murder, the Supreme Court delivered its ruling on the Brown v. Board of Education case, resulting in non-segregated schools. This verdict enraged many people in the South because they felt the ruling was uprooting their way of life. Two months after the Brown v. Board ruling, the First Citizens Council, which was a group of over 60,000 people all over the South who opposed racial integration of public schools, was formed. Other white supremacist groups, like the Ku Klux Klan, were very prevalent in Southern culture at the time. African American people lived in fear of being lynched just for existing amongst their white peers. In the summer of 1955, Emmett visited his cousins in Money from Chicago. He had begged his mother to go because he had heard many stories about money and wanted to see it for himself. Mamie had cautioned him about the cultural differences between Mississippi and Chicago, and Emmett promised to be on his best behavior. Every aspect of the vacation was going smoothly until, on August 24th, Emmett and his cousins went into the Bryant family store. Emmett went into the store by himself to buy some bubble gum while his cousins waited outside. When Emmett exited the store, he allegedly let out a wolf whistle at the white woman who is currently running the store, Carolyn Bryant. Carolyn ran to her husband's car to grab a shotgun and the boys ran away quickly. Four days after the incident, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam showed up to Moses Wright's house, Emmett's uncle. And he said, I want it. I want the boy that done all that talk. Moses and his wife pleaded with them, offering them money to let Emmett stay, but it didn't matter. Emmett was thrown into the back of the truck and driven away from his family who had never seen him alive again. On August 31st, Emmett's brutalized body was found by two young boys in the Tallahatchie River. Emmett, encased in a pine box, was later brought to Chicago by train. When Emmett was brought to the funeral home, Mamie insisted on seeing his body. He was bloated, one of his eyes was out of its socket, his ears had been cut off, and there was a gash in his head that Mamie had said she could see daylight through. Despite all this, Mamie decided to let the nation and the world see what these two men had done to her son. Emmett's body was shipped back to Chicago for his funeral. Despite the backlash she might face, Mamie insisted on an open casket funeral saying, let the world see what they did to my boy. A crowd of over 100,000 friends, family, and strangers came to see Emmett's body over the course of four days. Some of the most important being reporters Moses Nguyen and Simeon Booker, who were sent to cover Emmett's funeral for Jet and the Tri-State Defender magazines. Booker brought along the photographer David Jackson, who would take the infamous picture of Emmett that would spark nationwide outrage and sadness for generations to come. Pictures like that one and the media coverage of Emmett's funeral opened people's eyes to the horrors that were occurring right in the country they called home, making it clear a turning point was needed. Within a day after Till's disappearance, Bryant and Milam were arrested for the murder of Emmett. On September 23, 1955, less than a month after his death, there was a murder trial held for Roy Bryant and his half-brother J.W. Milam in Sumner at the Tallahatchie County Courthouse. Never has this quiet little cotton-growing community of Mississippi seen so much publicity and so much excitement as in the past few days. Nearly 200 of the town's five or 600 residents have packed into the courthouse to hear the day's proceedings. The trial was held by an all-white, all-male jury. This instantly made it near impossible for Milam and Bryant to be found guilty. When Moses Wright stood up in court and pointed out Milam and Bryant as the men who came to his home and took Emmett at gunpoint, he had changed the narrative of the trial. Willie Reed, an 18-year-old sharecropper, also testified that he heard beating and screaming coming from the Milam family shed. Do you have any evidence bearing on this case? 
I didn't know that this is my son. Carolyn Bryant claimed that when Emmett was buying something at the counter, Emmett made vulgar gestures and comments. Mrs. Bryant further testified that Emmett had made a dirty remark, which he refused to repeat in court. Her testimony was the one the jury would listen to. Milam and Bryant never took the stand. After only 67 minutes of deliberation, Milam and Bryant were found not guilty. Some jury members later admitted to taking a soda break before delivering their verdicts that they looked good. When society found out about the outcome of the trial, it outraged the African-American community nationwide. Then, on January 24, 1956, Look Magazine published an article with Milam and Bryant confessing to the crime. They were paid $4,000 for their justification as to why they murdered this young boy. Emmett's highly publicized death quickly brought attention to the other racial problems that were occurring in the United States, and he would eventually become a poster child for the brutality of lynching in the South. Rosa Parks attended a Till rally at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, where an unknown pastor named Martin Luther King Jr. was living. The speaker at the rally was a civil rights preacher by the name of T.R.M. Howard, and he was infuriated by the acquittal of Emmett's killers, and was motivated to make a change for the better because of his death. Just a couple of months after Emmett's death, on the 1st of December, Rosa Parks has been quoted saying that the reason she decided not to give up her seat on the bus was because young Emmett Till had been the foremost thought in her mind. Rosa knew that Emmett's death should not be in vain, and so she stood at her ground. Shortly after Rosa Parks made her courageous decision to stand up for what she believed was right, the Montgomery bus boycott began. The president of this campaign happened to be Martin Luther King Jr., who was also deeply saddened and enraged by Emmett's murder. He believed that Emmett was murdered as an intimidation tactic to prevent African Americans from voting that year. Dr. King would not let that happen, so he pressed forward and made sure that the boycott would be successful. Martin Luther King Jr. was so deeply impacted by Emmett's death, he gave multiple sermons with Emmett's lynching being mentioned as a symbol of racial injustice and wrongdoing. Some of the most notable would be what a mother should tell her child at the Ebenezer Baptist Church and Pride versus Humility, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, which was delivered at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. On Emmett Till's eight-year death anniversary, he gave his I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Martin and many other citizens' efforts paid off when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. This prohibited discrimination of people based on their race, sex, or religion, but the fight for equity was not over. While all this was happening, memberships at the NAACP and other civil rights organizations soared, and people wrote letters to their local, state, and even the federal government, pleading for legal action against lynching. Sadly, this wouldn't come until 2022. People were protesting, and many rallies were held in Emmett's name. The citizens would not rest until they believed that equality had been achieved. These people would start to refer to themselves as the Emmett Till generation. Over time, Emmett's murder was slowly forgotten until the 1990s when the film Eyes on the Prize was made. People started to retell the story of Emmett Till. More movies and books would follow like the 2022 release Till and the novel The Blood of Emmett Till. Historical markers at the site where Emmett's body was found in the Tallahatchie River were placed. The church where Emmett's funeral was held was made a Chicago landmark in 2005 and then changed to a national monument on July 25, 2023. A nine-foot bronze statue was installed of Emmett Till in Greenwood, Mississippi. The home where Mamie and Emmett used to live together was made into a museum honoring Emmett's life and Mamie's fight for justice for her son. On October 7, 2008, the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act was signed into law, allowing cold cases of violent crimes committed against African Americans to be reopened. Finally, on March 29, 2022, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act was passed. This made lynching a federal hate crime allowing for a more serious sentence of 30 years imprisonment. Without Emmett, Rosa Parks may have never given up her seat or Martin Luther King Jr. may have never decided to go through with the Montgomery bus boycott. The anti-lynching and civil rights acts may have been signed into law much later or never at all. The organizations fighting for racial justice may have just faded away from existence. All in all, Emmett's murder is a constant reminder that a positive turning point can be born from tragedy.